Good morning, and thank you all for tuning in. Obviously, I'm not Governor Scott. I'm Mike Smith, Secretary of Human Services. I'm kicking things off today because, as it was announced on Tuesday, Governor Scott is not join, joining us today. He needed uh, this time to address some of the work that was postponed due to yesterday's commitments. So we'll have uh, myself, uh, Secretary French, Commissioner uh, Levine, and Commissioner Sherling is available for questions as well. I'll start off today. As of last night, we have vaccinated 21,000 Vermonters. As you will see on the next two slides, if you look at it as the CDC does, as the rate of doses distributed per 100,000, Vermont ranks second in the nation in terms of the pace of receiving doses of vaccine and administering that vaccine into the arms of Vermonters. In addition, on the next slide, if you look at the doses per 100, we still rank fourth in the nation with three doses per 100 people, which is almost double the national average of 1.67. However, we need to keep accelerating our pace of vaccinations, even as supplies remain uneven and often disappointing. We have included approximately 4,500 uh, 4, first responders to Group 1A, primarily because we discovered that often these Vermonters are responding to accident scenes and 911 medical calls. They are ministering aid or helping to get individuals ready for transport even before EMS arrives. They are directly involved in patient care. We did ex uh, exclude those who do not have direct contact with patients, such as desk clerks or administrative leadership. As you, we, as you recall, we have prioritized long-term care facilities and long-term care residents and staff because they, the long-term care residents are the most vulnerable, as well as those medical workers and others who may treat vulnerable Vermonters in order to prevent death as the primary goal of, our fa of this first phase, or phase 1A. We expect that we'll be moving to the second phase, phase two, or those Vermonters in the general population that are 75 years or older once we finish 1A. I wanna remind, remind Vermonters about our primary objective in age grouping. That is to save lives. As you can see on our slide, on our next slide, most of the deaths happen in those age 65 and older. Although not on this slide, in fact, out of our 156 deaths, only 10 have been among those under the age of 65. So therefore, you can see why our primary objective is at those older uh, Vermonters in order to uh, prevent death. The system we have selected is the easiest to administer, easiest to understand, and uses data, as you can see, to support it instead of pitting groups of Vermonters against each other. And it fulfills, as I have said, our primary goal of preventing death. There are approximately 49,000 Vermonters in the category of age 75 and older once we finish this category, we'll move on to 70 plus and then 65 plus. And in total, these three groups will comprise of 125,000 Vermonters. With current allocations, it will take probably until the start of the spring to finish these groups. Lastly, over the past few days, we have seen increasing number of positive tests coming from staff at our correctional facilities. We'll be sending out a press release today about this, but staff members at five correctional facilities tested positive for COVID-19 this week through both private testing and mass staff testing. These mass staff testing is 
are part of these mass testing uh, strategies, are part of the Vermont's DOC COVID mitigation strategy as the virus enters our facility from the outside. As a result of these staff positives, these, um, these staff members um, being positive, these cases prompted modified lockdowns at Northern State Correctional Facility, Chittenden Regional Correctional Facility, Northwest State Correctional Facility, and Southern State Correctional Facility. Marble Valley Correctional Facility is in full lockdown pending results from a presumed positive staff member. In total, 37 Vermont Department of Corrections staff members have tested positive for COVID-19 since March of last year, 2020. Vermont DOC and the Vermont Department of Health have uh, immediately taken the following actions, and these are standard operating procedures upon receipt of a positive test. They contact uh, contact tracing team in, initiated with the rapid response team uh, to immediately find out who these individuals have been in contact with. Um, and we start testing uh, of the facility, facility-wide testing. Um, we also do full or modified lockdown in place for all Vermont correctional facilities with confirmed or presumed cases. Just to add on, we did test the, uh, the Chittenden Regional Correction Facility on Monday, January 4th, and all incarcerated individuals were negative. The Department of Corrections will have more on this today when they send out their press release, but I wanted to um, give you a uh, preview of what they will be talking about today. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Secretary French. Yeah, good morning. Um, our students returned to school this week after the holiday vacation. Uh, most schools have reopened under a hybrid model of some sort. We do collect uh, these data on a monthly basis to monitor the trends uh, around the different types of instructional models that schools are using. Um, these data are typically collected at the end of the month. Uh, because of the holiday period, uh, we've delayed the December collection until today, actually, uh, it closes. Uh, so we'll be able to provide an update on that information next week. We did continue our weekly surveillance testing of school staff this week. Uh, the participation rate was down a bit this week, uh, down to 31%. Typically, we've been around 40%. That's probably due to uh, scheduling challenges with the holidays. Um, we did identify three positive cases this week among school staff, uh, which brings the positivity rate uh, to about 0.17% still uh, substantially lower than the statewide positivity rate, which is about 2.9%. We unveiled our draft planning template this week for our education recovery work. Uh, this template uh, currently includes three interrelated domains or area of focus where we expect school districts to put their energies. Uh, the first one is mental health and well-being. Uh, the second is re-engagement and truancy. And the third is academic success and achievement. We'll be working with our stakeholder groups through the month of January to seek to finalize uh, the planning framework by the end of January. Um, I expect we're going to require each school district to submit a recovery plan uh, so that we can develop metrics to monitor the work from the state perspective, uh, to help coordinate the use of federal dollars to support the work, and also to coordinate the deployment of other state resources such as mental health to school districts. We expect schools will begin to engage in this recovery work later this winter and into the spring. Uh, and generally speaking, the recovery work in education is focused on mitigating the impact of the emergency on students from an educational perspective. To do that, we will require more in-person instruction and more in-person contact um, than we are currently providing our students. Um, so as the conditions improve in the coming months and with the advent of more vaccine and warmer weather, uh, we expect most schools will be able to return to nearly full in-person instruction after April vacation. 
I wanted to highlight um, a key, key aspect of this recovery work will be the dollars necessary to do the work. So I want to talk briefly and give you an update on uh, what we understand from the recent uh, package, uh, relief package that was passed by Congress. Uh, in this package, we expect Vermont to receive about $167 million for education. Uh, $34 million is focused for higher education and one hundred thirty-three for K-12. Uh, I did want to just call out and thank our congressional delegation. They've been tremendously supportive uh, throughout this emergency. The K-12 funding uh, will be coming down through existing programs that we already have that were established under the CARES Act. Uh, these two programs are the Elementary and Secondary Emergency Relief Fund, what we call ESSER, and the Governor's Education Emergency Relief Fund, or GEAR. Of the $133 million in K-12 funding, uh, Vermont's expected to receive about $127 million under the ESSER program. Uh, originally under the CARES Act, the original ESSER funding, we had about $30 million. So you can see that um, this new allocation is about four times as much as what we received previously under the ESSER fund. And we're expected to receive about 6.2 under the GEAR. Previously, we had received uh, about $4 million uh, under the GEAR. And at this point, uh, we're waiting to receive some additional guidance from the U.S. Department of Education on how to administer these funds. Um, but since the funds are being delivered through these existing programs, we expect to receive the funds at the state level fairly quickly. It will be important uh, that we do uh, move forward as quickly as possible with uh, nailing down our recovery planning uh, so that we can ensure that we maximize the use of the funds uh, for that recovery work. Uh, my initial impression uh, as of this week is that the funds are going to put us in a really good position to make a significant impact uh, on the benefit of students from that recovery work. So at that, uh, I'll conclude my update and turn it over to uh, Commissioner Levine. Thank you. morning. <clears throat> I'll start with our case update this morning. Uh, as you can see, we're up to 8,619 total cases, 156 deaths. Yesterday we reported 213 cases, and today we are reporting 202 cases. The one more death brings us to the 156 number. Um, If you could go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> Our percent positivity rate over a seven-day period is still uh, in the twos, but just hovering close to 3%. Still far from, um, fortunately, uh, much of the rest of the region and the country, but as you'll note, it has been increasing, along with our death rate. At a time when our nation has just reported yet setting yet another record with uh, exceeding 4,000 deaths. There are currently 29 individuals in the hospital and eight in the ICU. The range we're seeing in numbers of hospitalized patients is still certainly higher than we are accustomed to, but not markedly increasing. This is our uh, syndromic surveillance data, which is confirmatory not only regarding COVID, but confirmatory in some sense regarding influenza as well. Uh, we're not seeing marked upticks in patients presenting with symptoms of those conditions. And um, much of the rest of the country is also noting that the influenza season is not really taking off at this point in time, fortunately, and hopefully we can maintain that stance. I'm showing the uh, long-term care facility um, list today uh, because I know many of you pay attention to these numbers, <clears throat> and I'm showing to, to you in a different light today, and the light I'm showing is that the list is not markedly increasing in numbers of facilities, and the numbers of cases is not accelerating uh, at a high rate. So when we talk about our new cases in Vermont, yes, some of them are represented on this slide, but they are not by any means uh, the major proportion anymore. And as you know, when we follow an outbreak, we need to follow it for two incubation periods past the last case 
So many of these facilities stay on the list for a long time. But that doesn't mean that they're having more and more cases every week um, at that kind of a level. <clears throat> we, you know, at any point in time, we follow at least 40 outbreaks, 200 range situations. Um, obviously, we can't report on all of those to you at this uh, press conference, uh, nor would there be a lot of value to that. Um, as you know, in the past, when we've had certain outbreaks, like the ice, ice team sports outbreak in central Vermont, obviously that merited uh, significant attention. The only one of those that at this point in time would merit attention is in Addison County, and that is, I think, well known to many already regarding uh, Christmas weekend services, three separate services at a uh, church uh, where a number of households were gathered, and uh, indeed we've seen uh, a lot of transmission within those households and across um, people who attended that church, and the uh, number is now up to 80 total. That continues to provide part of the increase in cases, but obviously not, again, the major proportion of 200 cases reported in a night. It's fair to say that um, <clears throat> some of what we're seeing in these recent case counts <clears throat> is the impact of the holidays. Just like around the country, the result of people traveling and gathering together. I do get a lot of questions regarding gatherings and ski resorts, though. And I want to get into some very early available information specific to them. First, regarding the ski uh, situations. We have found nine cases among people who have been at ski areas, the majority of those are actually employees. Just like we see at other workplaces at times when there's more virus prevalent in our communities. And while this is a good start for the ski season, we strongly encourage everyone to continue wearing masks and following distancing recommendations so everyone who enjoys that outdoor activity can continue to do so. Regarding gatherings, our contact tracing teams thus far have identified six gatherings related to the recent holidays that have a potential for further spread. Examples are multiple families gathering together and a large birthday party. Some are like the Halloween events that you might recall led to a rise in cases for a period of time after that holiday. Our teams are not finding evidence that significant outbreaks have occurred related to the types of gatherings that were allowed for over the holidays. And there's far more evidence of isolated cases related to community prevalence. It's still too early to see the impact of any New Year's Eve gatherings at this time. <clears throat> And while we're also watching for any impact in our communities from Vermonters who return to the state after attending the tragically violent event in Washington this week, this situation is an important reminder that if you do travel out of state, and please don't, that you need to quarantine and get tested. For your safety and out of consideration for your families, Vermonters, and your communities. We all rely on each other to do our part to keep the virus from spreading. Unfortunately, the U.S. continues to set records for deaths. Cases are surging. Hospitals are overwhelmed in many places. We've been told by many in Washington, including Dr. Fauci, that it will get worse this month. In Vermont, cases had really leveled off after Thanksgiving, but we know with this virus, we're never really safe, and we're certainly not immune to the havoc that COVID-19 is causing in the rest of the country. We know there's more virus in our communities now and more potential for spread. We see it in our situation reports every day, where every aspect of society is being impacted in one way or another. So what does this mean for Vermonters? I wish I could offer new advice, because I hate 
that the COVID fatigue that many of us are experiencing would take away from its importance. But the fact is, we really do know how this virus works and what works against it. And that's what you already know, wearing a mask, keeping six foot distance, avoiding travel and gatherings and staying home when you're sick. And unfortunately, the news of a more transmissible variant of the virus in the US only should give us more reason to redouble our efforts. As of yesterday, the list of states that reported the variant included Texas, Connecticut, and Pennsylvania, joining California, Colorado, Georgia, Florida, and New York, just across our own border in Saratoga Springs. Some people in which the variant is detected have reported travel to the appropriate places in the UK and Ireland, but others have no travel history, suggesting that the variant is already circulating here. As I mentioned Tuesday, I do expect we will see it here in Vermont as well. It may mean more people will get COVID-19 and need medical care, and more of the population will need to be vaccinated. But it won't necessarily mean you will get sicker with this variant than with the virus we've been living with for some time. And some very preliminary news from Pfizer indicates that the UK and Saudi variants of the virus do seem to be effectively dealt with by the vaccine. It's early news, it's encouraging, but we need to uh, have it confirmed and have more uh, peer review of that. In another bit of preliminary news, in addition to the UK variant, Dr. Burks has been talking about the fact that she feels there may be a fall winter variant prevalent throughout the US. But as of yet, there's no really firm sequencing data to support that. The same concerns pertain to this variant as with the UK variant. It's associated with asymptomatic transmission, increased, increased asymptomatic transmission, increased hospitalizations, and a reversal in some states of what had been declining case counts. To mitigate it, same lures suggestions. Proactive testing, especially in youth, to protect the most vulnerable. Proactive therapeutics, usually those given by infusion, like the antibodies, but those have had about 25% uptake by most states thus far. And then, of course, vaccinations, using a strategy like we are using with the highest risk by age through community immunization sites. <clears throat> Speaking uh, briefly of vaccinations, as you've heard, we now have 21,000 people vaccinated. And in a report that should be very reassuring, the CDC has reported on allergic reactions, especially including life-threatening anaphylaxis after the receipt of the first dose of the Pfizer vaccine during the latter half of December. They reported a total of 21 cases after almost 2 million doses were administered for a rate of 11 cases per million. The majority of these occurred within the standard 15-minute waiting period, and they occurred in people with a history of allergic reactions. So in these first immunizations uh, weeks, anaphylaxis did seem to be a rare event. I do want to again remind everyone that we are still learning how long it takes for immunity to develop following vaccination. So once you receive a vaccine, it is still important that you follow the precautions to prevent exposure and transmission in the coming weeks and months after that. And finally, I wanted to share one more bit of news and proudly highlight some data from our own health department scientists published yesterday in the CDC's Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, where once again Vermont has helped shape national policy. You'll recall since May, we've allowed people who are in quarantine due to recent travel or exposure to a COVID-19 positive patient to end their quarantine on, on or after day seven, assuming they remain free of symptoms and have a negative test at that time. 
Our analysis demonstrated that this policy has had a minimal impact on further spread of the virus, with only 3% of people identified as close contacts testing positive on day seven. These data support recommendations like those recently proposed by the CDC to shorten the quarantine period. They've also benefited the overall COVID-19 response by identifying asymptomatic people earlier in their course of illness through the increased availability of testing. I'll stop there and I believe we start the question and answers now to whomever they be directed. Thank you, Dr. Levine. So as you mentioned, um, we're, we're not really seeing any widespread cases um, because of the, uh, the, the one trusted household rule over the holidays. I'm wondering if you know, we'll continue to use this data and potentially use it to uh, loosen restrictions, uh, make this go forward. Because I know as of right now, that has been uh, banned, right? Right, that expired on January 2nd. It'd be premature to try to set policy today. We don't have complete information from Christmas, and we still have to get information from New Year's. Um, so um, I wouldn't want to even conjecture where we would go with that at this point in time. Obviously, we're seeing a higher caseload in general, uh, which may or may not have any relationship to the question you answered. Uh, but we're going to have to watch the data closely. And I would not want to even hazard a guess before 14 days post New Year's Eve had elapsed. Um, the secondary question for you and maybe for Secretary French as well. So last night, Governor Scott said that he hopes to have uh, students back in the classroom by April. Um, you know, we're still seeing increased case counts. And as Secretary Smith said, you know, we're, we're doing well in um, getting the vaccine in, in Vermonters' arms, but we're still seeing increased case counts and we're, as you mentioned, still seeing supply chain issues. I'm wondering, you know, how, how realistic that, that goal is. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll say my first few words. Uh, you heard the uh, surveillance testing positivity rate, which again, is just totally remarkable. And I have to believe that everyone who works in the school environment takes this so seriously that they are being really careful in their lives. Uh, but the fact is, when we do see these cases, even the newest ones that have come in, they still are very much isolated cases within a household, within a worker at a school, uh, and we're not seeing uh, the kind of spread through the school environment that would really make us uh, want to really reanalyze this whole situation. We've done very well for the entire first half of the school year, and uh, we'll have to keep tracking the data now. But at this point in time, um, you know, with vaccine coming in as slow as you indicate, uh, and it's not going to make a big difference in the lives of most of the state right away because we're getting it out as fast as we can to the priority populations, uh, we have no reason to change our stance on the schools because they continue to enjoy really, I think, good progress. Um, I'll let Secretary French talk more about uh, the, the future planning he was alluding to in his comments. Yeah, thanks, Calvin. I think, you know, um, certainly our ability to do in person is predicated on the conditions, you know, and I think to our, our credit as a state, I think one of the things we've done very well, largely with the leadership of the Department of Health, is to craft our guidance based on our conditions in Vermont. And arguably, our, our guidance is some of the more restrictive and um, comprehensive uh, than, than many states in, in the country. So, you know, we're looking forward. We need to look forward. We have to do that planning. Um, and that's, that's sort of the education side of it. Uh, we have, um, we know students have been significantly impacted by this emergency. Um, we, thinking forward, if we could project forward based on what we know today, we would expect to return in the fall, you know, to quote unquote normal or something like that. Uh, but the point is, I think with, with this emergency, we can't afford to wait to the fall to begin to address the needs of students. And every, every week that goes by that we don't do that, there's risk involved in that as well. So we're, we're optimistic based on what we know of, you know, the advent of more vaccine coming and certainly conditions improving, warming, warmer weather and so forth. 
um, but our ability to do more in person um, is certainly predicated on our analysis of the uh, conditions. Steve? Um, actually, Dr. Levine or uh, Mike, uh, whichever. Uh, just wondering, uh, I've gotten a couple of questions about as we move forward with the, uh, with the age brackets and everything, and we get to the general population, uh, obviously the federal system, the, uh, uh, the inoculations are happening in the healthcare facilities. Uh, where are people going to be able to go to get these, are, uh, you know, and is, uh, you know, who's going to administer them? If you go to the drug stores, you've got that 15-minute wait period things like that, and they, they were wondering about how much training is going on for these folks to, to get that done. Yeah, if, I, if it's to the general public, I think there's going to be several avenues by the time we get to the, uh, the general public, and I think there's going to be several avenues throughout this whole process as we move forward. Uh, you talked about pharmacies. That may be one area because the federal government has a phase two where they're going to just ship directly to pharmacies um, with their vaccine. But I think you're going to see um, district offices, district health offices, these pod, these uh, sort of these community uh, vaccination sites that we'll have up uh, through a variety of people using uh, personnel at the health department, using personnel that are trained, personnel at, the, um, at various other uh, state agencies that are trained. Um, you'll see EMS probably be involved in this, and you'll see National Guard probably involved in this, in these community vaccination sites that we talked about. You'll also see hospitals involved. I'm, I'm uh, you know, as we're putting this together, I think hospitals will play a, a role here, not only getting it out to the primary care physicians, which also will have a role here, um, but, you know, we're, it's going to be multiple um, players involved at multiple locations so that you um, don't have to drive more than 30 minutes to get a vaccine. That's what, that's what we're looking at, and it will be as well publicized as uh, you can imagine. So folks will literally be able to walk in pretty much. Or, or do you need to? There's going to be a register. Yeah, yeah, there is going to be a registration system because there has to be when you right. have uh, age groupings. You're going to have to have a registration system. So there will be a registration system um, that we'll be announcing uh, shortly. Very good. All right. Thank you. Stewart, NBC Five. Good morning. Uh, there is some new reporting this morning that President-elect Biden will release all available vaccine doses and not hold back supply for a second dose. And I'm wondering, Dr. Levine, what your thinking is about the pros and cons of that. Um, and could you handle a doubling or, you know, at least a sharp increase in the pace of vaccinations? Thanks for that question. Uh, <clears throat> And that is truly, Stuart, you, you would agree, breaking news, since it just kind of came across uh, this morning uh, within the last hour or two. Uh, so we don't have the fleshiness of the details yet, fleshing out of the details. Uh, but what you said is essentially what I know, that there will be more first doses available uh, to be deployed across the country um, because of the fact that the current administration the minute they send a dose to Vermont, they hold the dose in reserve so that in three weeks, if it's Pfizer or four weeks, if it's Moderna, that same person can get their second dose injected. What President-elect Biden has proposed is to not hold that in reserve and just keep sending uh, vaccine to the state. Part of that means the state then has a little bit of uh, more work to do, I would think, understanding how many doses they need to get in to give to people for their second dose uh, while they're still trying to have an accelerated pace of in injecting their first doses. So it's going to be challenging. I do like philosophically getting more vaccine in at an early time as much as possible, but I would like the comfort of knowing that the manufacturer and quality assurance processes are matching that so that we'll keep getting more vaccine in to inject to people, but we'll always have that second dose. Because I don't think we want to do what England has done, which is basically say, 
We don't know when people will get their second dose. It could be months and months later, uh, but we're willing to do that so that everybody gets their first dose. I'm not convinced that's a wise path to take. It doesn't follow the data and the evidence of the studies, and there is no study that tells us how much further out you can get your second dose and still get the biggest bang for your buck, if you will. So um, we'll have to wait and see when more details are forthcoming and when they start talking about the questions I've talked about, which will be the first ones everybody's going to ask, um, trying to have some secure knowledge that they can accelerate their pace of the first doses, but still comfortably tell people they're going to get their second dose in a timely way. Um, okay. My second question, I'm not sure to whom this should be directed, but uh, we have been getting a lot of email about that busload of people who returned from that protest on Wednesday uh, and the images that showed, you know, no one wearing a mask because they were getting off the bus. Uh, are you doing anything to ensure they are in quarantine? Can you assure Vermonters that they are? Yeah, so let's start uh, in the beginning. Clearly, I, I, I would probably say that the Facebook posting has gone viral, uh, at least within Vermont. Um, and clearly, uh, it indicates lack of compliance with the guidance that we traditionally talk about with regard to distancing from people, uh, capacity within the bus, wearing of masks, et cetera. And we know that from footage of what happened in Washington, uh, that none of those rules were abided by very well by a larger population. So, so certainly a high-risk enterprise. Um, we certainly um, made sure that communication went out to everyone on the bus at the time they arrived, indicating that we recommend very strongly quarantine, testing, uh, because that's really what one would do, just like if one had a gathering uh, at Christmas. We told everybody, you need to be doing testing for that regard as well. But we feel very strongly about the quarantine issue. Um, unlike if there's a positive case who we would tell to then isolate, um, we don't really have regulatory power to enforce somebody being quarantined when they're not yet a case. Uh, so we have to be very careful about that in terms of uh, how much authority we can exercise. But we've been very strong with the information about quarantining and with um, obtaining a test. Uh, thank you. Um, follow up to Calvin's question to Secretary French. This April, um, you know, date for students returning in full. How how confident are you with that actually happening? Is this an aspirational goal, or is it realistic? If if teachers aren't vaccinated, um, and it it doesn't sound, you know, unless they're in the older age bands, that they would be. Um, and, and obviously, the you know, the virus may still be around in the community. How how confident are you that 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 can actually happen? Well, uh, thank you. It's certainly an aspirational goal, but it's informed by a real assessment of our conditions and a projection of what those conditions will be like in April. As much as anyone can do that, um, but it is also important to acknowledge, as I mentioned, uh, there is some educational uh, need for us to address this issue. Um, also, it's an acknowledgement that it takes uh, some planning to point the education system towards this work. Um, so I don't think it's time lost for us to begin that planning. Um, honestly, we had tried to do that planning in October, and then uh, the conditions worsened, so we sort of put it on the back burner because we knew we had to get through this challenging uh, sort of holiday period, if you will. But we think the time's right now to start doing that planning. Um, and just to give people a sense of when we think uh, we'll start to see some real progress in terms of implementing that planning. But all that could change based on the conditions. But it's, uh, it's important to identify that sort of timeline for the system uh, so we can begin to uh, do the planning and to uh, allocate our resources accordingly. 
And, and um, thank you. And, and then maybe a question for um, Dr. Levine regarding the Addison County numbers, which are have have just been going way up. Um, and and this church uh, Christmas Eve gathering was was that the Victory Baptist Church? Can you say? And were occupancy requirements exceeded for that gathering? Do you know? Uh, you named the church correctly. I'm not aware that occupancy limits were exceeded, but uh, I can't definitively say that. Okay, thank you. Um, I did want to add one other comment to my previous comments regarding the uh, bus, and that's only that you know what we're really asking for is what we've asked all Vermonters to do from the beginning: not only abide by the guidance, but be altruistic and look out for one another. So the act of going into a quarantine after such a uh, bus ride and the enhanced risk is really to protect themselves, their own families, their communities, and Vermonters in general. So if anyone didn't really get that message coming off the bus, uh, I'm voicing it to you now in that spirit. Thank you. Yes, this is likely for Dr. Levine as well. Uh, for the bus company, has the state been in contact with them, considering it doesn't appear like they were adhering to the state's guidance? I'm not Dr. Levine, Mike Sherling from Public Safety. Uh, Public Safety was in touch with the bus company. Uh, the restrictions are on travelers, uh, interstate uh, operations for transit are still functional. So folks' responsibility is personal to adhere to the, uh, the, the quarantine guidance. So does that mean that buses full of people are still going in and out of the state? Uh, interstate transportation remains uninterrupted. So whether it's an airplane, personal car, bus, uh, to the extent you can get a ferry right now, uh, those modes of transportation are all still functional. Okay, thank you. Mike Donahue, The Islander. Uh, thanks, Rebecca. Uh, Secretary Smith, uh, thanks to you and to Governor Scott for restoring police and firefighters to the list of essential people that need to be near the front for the vaccine shots. I've received several emails and calls in the past few days asking me to thank you for protecting emergency first responders. And I know the governor was missed that they were sort of pumped out. Um, and I understand Bennington police where they had an outbreak has already started to receive their shots. So uh, I'm just passing along the thanks of many people. Um, with that said, um, how many police in Vermont have tested positive for COVID? And I'm told uh, this morning there apparently is a large number of people associated with the state police barracks in Rutland, and there there may be a quarantine down there. Do you know anything about that? Good afternoon, Mike. It's Mike Shirtling from Public Safety again. Uh, we don't have a, a full count of the number of uh, first responders that have tested positive, but uh, I think anecdotally I would say that number is in the um, it's in the tens, probably in the low tens, you know, 20 or 30 uh, that we're aware of. Um, relative to the Rutland barracks, uh, we did have uh, an event where there's an exposure to a shift, so that we have a, a number of folks that are in. Uh, preventive isolation as a result of that with testing pending. Uh, can you define a number of people? The last count I had, I think, is eight or nine. But that evolves. Out of as, how many on a shift? Uh, Out of how many on a shift? That is the entire night shift for that barracks, uh, as I understand it. But uh, I should say that number is potentially malleable as contact tracing uh, occurs. And, and uh, the question I had asked was how many police, I know you gave 20 to 30 maybe first responders, but how many, how many in the state police have tested positive for COVID? You must have a number of your own department. Uh, again, I don't have a firm number because we don't always know um, 
the, the health, uh, unless it impacts work, we don't always know the health status of an employee, but uh, that number is uh, probably in the, it's in the single digits, but I don't know exactly what it is. I would guess six or seven. Okay. And my other question, probably for Secretary Smith, uh, this comes uh, on behalf of a retired 26 year uh, retired military person who has lung issues apparently due to his service in Vietnam and Agent Orange. <clears throat> he is 70 years old and is scheduled for an infusion for his lung uh, or lungs on February 3rd, but has been told he will need to wait another six months until the fall before he can medically get cleared for a COVID vaccine shot. Yet on the other hand, if he were to get his vaccine sh shot soon, he would only have to wait six weeks for the much needed lung infusion. So it's six months or six weeks. Is there anything that the state can do in this case to help this retired Army veteran? Um, let me, I won't even hazard to uh, give an answer on that, given my background is not medical. I'm probably going to ask Dr. Levine to, uh, to uh, take that question. Dr. Levine. Don't you have an honorary degree here? <laughs> yeah, Mike, obviously this is complex. And it would be, it would be uh, premature to give any kind of answer at a podium with the details that you've provided. Um, you know, I think 70 years old is in the second group of the age banding. So it's not like six months away. It's um, hopefully six weeks away um, in that time frame. So if you would like to have that individual, um, you know, or, or, you, or through you, get us details, I can at least make some comments on the situation. Um, but otherwise, you know, I, I have to say there are going to be potentially 600,000 special situations, and that's not going to be a coherent way for us to run a uh, large vaccination campaign to get the most vulnerable in the state taken care of first in a methodical way. But certainly, I'm willing to hear something out that. Uh, you can provide me. Okay. <clears throat> very good. Thank you very much. I'll get to. Uh... Aaron, VT Digger. Aaron. Joe, the Barton Chronicle. Um, hello, I have one question, and I'm not sure exactly what to call the second thing, but I'm going to do that first. I received um, an email from one of our readers who says that... Um, her organization, which is a, you know, a group of educators, no, are noticing major impacts on families' housing and utility bill needs uh, as they wait for new COVID support money to come through. And uh, this woman says the, uh, the problem is causing a lot of stress and people are losing housing in the kingdom. And um, I guess the question is, does the state have some kind of way to provide uh, alternative ways to support these people while they wait. I wonder if Secretary Curley might be able to speak to some of the, I know we have rental assistance programs. There are also uh, the, yeah. the PUC recently reinstated the, the um, moratorium on utility disconnection. So there are a number of resources. I wonder if Secretary Curley could speak to a couple of those, but I know there are quite a few resources in place. Yeah, I think that um, and there's a lot to unpack in that question in terms of the variety of things that people may be experiencing. And um, as Rebecca said, there, um, 
the moratorium on on disconnection is is extended so hopefully people aren't losing you know their connectivity or their their power or whatever it may be um i would just say if, if you're willing to reach out to me offline we definitely can connect you with uh the housing and community development commissioner who can talk about our our rental programs and make sure that people aren't uh losing housing we do have have several dollars still to help in that arena so I would uh, love to hear from you, and um, or I can try to reach out to you after, but, but let's make sure people are taken care of. Thank you. Um, I have one other question. This is for Dr. Levine. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about the new variant of um, COVID, and it's frequently stated that it's more um, easily transmissible what does that mean exactly? Is that would that be seen, for example, in um, instead of 15 minutes being a contact, a shorter period of time being a contact, or am I misunderstanding what that means? Yeah. So, uh, practically speaking, what it means is that the person that you might contract COVID from might have a higher load of virus in all those nasal and oral secretions that they're spewing out when they cough uh, or when they yell at you or what have you. Um, so um, more virus available to infect you from an individual who has the virus. Um, and it has to do with uh, some changes due to mutation changes that occur in these spike proteins that impact the way they bind with the receptors in our nose and other places. Um, and um, so, so that's kind of what it all fits together as, without getting too, too detailed. Um, should the, the new variety um, appear and spread widely in Vermont, would you anticipate that would change the recommendations um, or people's behavior at all? The only change would be to redouble their efforts. Um, there is no other real uh, public health guidance or behavior change that uh, would go beyond the current, but it would only be to redouble your efforts doing all of the current uh, because Again, with a higher transmission rate, you may find you're encountering more people who put you at risk. Uh, so if you're not keeping a distance from them, if you're not wearing a mask in their presence, if you're not avoiding a congested uh, indoor space, um, you may be more readily able to pick up the virus than you would have with the former version. Thank you very much. Avery, WCAX. Avery, WCAX. All right, Tim, from our business magazine. I guess a lot of my colleagues are with the governor somewhere. <laughs> um, uh, Mike Smith, I, you know, I, I was struck by the numbers you were providing on vaccines distributed. And a lot of the places that are getting very high rates, like Vermont, are actually have relatively low, uh, relatively low case counts and deaths. And I'm wondering if, you know, maybe those vaccine numbers, those vaccines should be going to, to places that are, are having a much more difficult times, you know, Arizona, California, Florida, the Atlanta, Georgia, Georgia area. It, I'm wondering if, if, if that crossed your mind at all. No, Tim, that hasn't crossed my mind at all. Um, and I'll tell you why. I mean, there are lots of doses going out to those larger states, and I know that um, they are uh, trying to administer them as, as quick as possible. We are doing a good job here in Vermont. I think, you know, we have seen an increase in our death rate in the last um, month or two. And, you know, it, it, it is imperative to me, at least, 
that uh, we try to get those that are most vulnerable, those that are 65 and up, vaccinated as quick as possible. Um, even with um, the dosages that we're getting, just think about this. Um, we're getting about eight, you know, 8,800 a week. Um, we have about 125,000 of the most vulnerable we've, we've got to get to. We haven't got to that phase yet. When we get to that phase, you know, we're looking, as I said, to spring to get this done at the, uh, at the pace that we are at the beginning of spring, at the pace we're going. So, um, you know, I would say not to cut back anything in coming to Vermont. Let's get the most vulnerable um, vaccinated and let's, um, uh, and we have been uh, doing that in a, in a exquisite way and I just want to keep that up. All right, great, thanks, Mike. Yeah. I just wanted to flag an addition there. It's Mike Sherling from Public Safety. The, the, the nature of that question actually goes all the way back to April uh, relative to Vermont's uh, good performance and our efforts to ensure that uh, whether it was PPE, ventilators, testing supplies, and all of the things that have been critical through the response, uh, the federal government has been very receptive to our argument all right along that good performance should not penalize our ability to continue to respond. So this is just the latest example of uh, those change to the extent that they have been viable, um, being consistent regardless of performance. Uh, thanks, Mike. Chris Roy, the Newport Daily Express. Chris Roy, Greg, the county courier. Good morning. Not quite sure who, whom I should direct this call, uh, question to, um, but I'm wondering about the reversal on the policy that now is going to allow first responders to get vaccinated, which obviously closely aligns with the CDC guidelines. Who in state government first made the suggestion not to have emergency responders get vaccinated and instead uh, distribute those vaccines on an age-based system? The EMS category was always in 1A. Uh, what we have do done is basically just expand the EMS category because we realize that, um, that many of these first responders, as I talked about, are actually the first on the scene that are giving uh, medical attention to these individuals. So we included them into that sort of broad, that EMS definition because that's what they do. We did not include into this definition uh, patients such as uh, people that are at desk or clerks or administrative leadership into this. So once we realized in terms of the 911, uh, how 911 medical calls, how responding to accidents really happen, it was an easy call. EMS and these um, first responders are doing similar things to help patients uh, that, um, in some cases, vulnerable patients. I, I understand that, uh, Mr. Secretary. I'm, I'm wondering, uh, the original uh, advice from CDC, the guidelines from CDC were to have all emergency responders get it before the general public. I'm wondering who in state government, who had the idea originally bypass those policies. I don't, I, Greg, I'm going to take some exception to that because I don't think there was any intention to bypass um, these first oh. responders. I think what we should have done out of the gate is make sure that we broaden the EMS category on this. We didn't do that. Oh, I guess let me make it a little more direct because I have two, two people there, Dr. Levine and Secretary Smith, was it either of your ideas to not administer this to all emergency responders first? 
I don't, this is, this is a hard question because I don't, there wasn't any sort of, there, there wasn't any sort of pre-planned to exclude them. There was, it was just who do we include into the EMS category? And I don't think there was any discussion of who to exclude. We thought we were including everybody that does sort of these medical emergencies. If anything, it was an oversight. And here's, uh, I'll have Mike Sherling talk a little bit more about it. Yeah, thanks for the, the question. Um, to the extent there's a perception that the that first responders were skipped over, I, I think that is just a, it's a perception. There was, uh, what was communicated was the overall community strategy to go by age band while we were still contemplating what the nuances of what is now happening in 1A and the eventual uh, clarification of the EMS responder was. And I think I've clearly communicated that to all the police and, and fire chiefs uh, that were um, in that uh, cohort of folks that, that received the clarifying guidance. Okay. Well, I, I was just trying to figure out who in state government had the idea to change the policy Greg, from I what was first ended down. Do you have another one? I can Thank you. Andrea, seven days. Hi there. Um, I'm hoping to um, find out, do you actually, do you have a list of everyone who was on the bus to um, D.C., and is that how you contacted them? So uh, Mike Sherling from Public Safety again. We do not have a comprehensive list of the folks that were on the bus. Uh, we were able to make contact with the bus company while the bus was still en route from Washington back to Vermont. And the bus company graciously agreed to make an announcement to all of the uh, folks that were on the bus uh, to reinforce the quarantine requirements. Okay, and, and is that uh, a list that you are trying to um, trying to get in order to kind of make sure that that people are are quarantining. It is not. Again, uh, by and large, interstate travel remains um, a, a, an open mode of of uh, transportation. Uh, the key is that for people who are choosing to use interstate transportation, uh, again, airplanes, buses, uh, boats, and and cars, uh, that they. Uh, adhere to the, the public health guidance that has been laid out, uh, both by executive order and by the health department. Okay. Um, but is, is it the case, though, that, that the bus was over the capacity that, that Vermont, um, you know, the, that social distancing public transit capacity? Uh, we don't actually have a restriction on distance on public transportation. So, for example, airlines have the ability to determine the, their capacity, and then passengers have to determine what the correct, uh, you know, safety footing for each individual person should be. Uh, but that said, uh, if you're with, if you travel at all, notwithstanding the fact that there's an increased risk as a result of the lack of masks and the close distance that these folks were to each other, you still have to maintain, uh, you still have to adhere to the quarantine requirements that we have in place. I would just say and, and defer to Dr. Levine if he has anything else has anything else to add. There's certainly enhanced risk as a result of the proximity and the lack of masks. Um, okay. Um, and, and, thank you. And, and, at um, the, and at the very okay. least, because they've traveled out of state, our guidance in the state of Vermont is you must quarantine when you return. And so that message was made very clear. Right. Um, and and a, a question on um, vaccination. Um, plans for teachers is is that going to be a um, prerequisite for that goal of moving back to full in person um, that that teachers are vaccinated um, by that kind of April um, goal. Hi, this is Secretary French. 
Uh, it's not directly tied at the moment. Um, certainly an assessment of the conditions is really uh, what we'll be looking closely at and vaccination factors into the overall conditions. Did Secretary French, do you have the data on how many schools are currently operating in person fully? Yeah, I mean, current, we've been pretty steady at about 75% or in hybrid. Uh, we certainly saw a, a doubling of in-person instruction at the elementary level after the initial reopening period. Um, but we keep, on a monthly basis, keep an eye on that data. Um, we'll see how it plays out. But we do already have. Yeah, we have quite a bit of in-person going. Yeah. Um, but, but as far as that goal of, of full in-person, um, uh, the vaccination is, is not going to be a prerequisite. To the extent that vaccination will help us improve the conditions, it is, uh, but it's not tied directly to uh, vaccinating the school staff themselves currently. Okay. Um, thank you. You're welcome. going to add a uh, clarifying or correction on uh, one of the things I said a moment ago. Agency of Commerce has, uh, has texted that charter buses do have a 50 percent restriction. So uh, technically that, uh, that charter should have only had 50 percent. And, and is that, does the state have enforcement um, capacity in that regard? We will reach back out to the, uh, to the bus company. Um, and uh, have a, an educational conversation on that. Okay, thank you. Lisa, the Valley Reporter. Hi, this question is for Secretary Smith. I wanna follow up on a question raised by Mike Donahue on Tuesday about the appropriateness of ski patrollers receiving the vaccine. And you said you would look into it. And I'm wondering what you have concluded. And I'm wondering how you could conclude that ski patrollers are anything other than EMS first responders. I, thank you for the question, because I, I didn't conclude anything other than they are first responders. Um, many of the cases, you will find that they are, in fact, uh, EMT or EMS qualified and have all the certifications for that. And in many cases, they actually operate as EMS in other sort of jurisdictional or work environments. So the, the, the information, I, I really thank you for the question, the information that you just said that many are qualified and do fall under e, the EMS uh, qualification. Thank you very much. I'm happy to hear that. Greg, the Bennington Banner. Uh, hello, and thank you. Uh, my question is about, uh, this might be for, um, uh, for Secretary Smith with regards to the um, uh, Department of Corrections officers uh, testing positive for, for COVID. I was wondering if you could tell me where offices are testing positive, what's the current status of inmates testing positive uh, throughout the state correction system, uh, and are any testing positive at Marble Valley or Southern State? Yeah, I don't, Greg, I don't have the precise numbers. This is sort of, uh, I, I put it in because the uh, Department of Corrections is going to be doing a press release this afternoon. I will say the bulk of uh, the positives, the, the, the vast majority of the positives our staff um, and is uh, and it is in all facilities um, in terms of small numbers one two that sort of um, uh, numbers mm -hmm. in all our facilities except St. Johnsbury and and ironically um, at least through the last testing period uh, Mississippi um, right. and and then um, and then in terms of incarcerated individuals, like I said, um, it's very few, and if they, and it's, it, it's predominantly a lot less than, um, than, the, uh, than the five or six or, or seven uh, correctional officers that we're talking about here. 
Okay. Um, so I'm a little puzzled then as to why we have a full lockdown at Marble Valley since I'm not hearing that um, that's the facility closest to us here in Bennington. Um, you know, some, uh, I'm not hearing uh, cases of, of guards or inmates there. Yeah. Uh, so I wonder if you could, if you have any more detail on why that's gone full yeah. lockdown. Yeah, there are um, two case, uh, at least one case and at least one suspected case waiting for results. All right. Um, has any has the administration made any uh, determinations as to whether when um, uh, if if and or when uh, inmates will be vaccinated? No, that has not been determined. If it's in the age band, as you know, our uh, our inmates, our inmate populations fairly. There are some people that would fall in the age band um, at the at the get go on that, but um, there has been no determination yet, other than the age um, the age grouping that uh, would uh, determine any sort of um, coming out of priority from the age group grouping system that we've talked about. So if you're 75 plus and incarcerated, you will get vaccinated. If you're um, 25 plus, you'll have to wait like everyone else so far. All right. Um, and if, if you might indulge me, I just wonder if there's any update that, the, that the, um, uh, Mr. Sterling might be able to offer on the um, investigation into uh, Trooper Hall in the Shaftesbury Barracks. I, I'd like, for example, is, has, has the determination been reached or is, is, uh, um, are there any updates that you can announce in, into, the, into that investigation? Uh, nothing substantive at this time. It's only been uh, 24 hours, but we do anticipate right. having that uh, concluded by very early next week with updates to follow. All right. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Andrew, the Caledonian record. Uh, yes, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, this is for Secretary French. Uh, as you know, um, local school boards across the state are in the process of finalizing the budgets to be presented to their voters at town meeting. I'm wondering how challenging do you think this environment will be for schools uh, to get budgets passed? Um, and are any of the recovery um, monies available uh, for normal operating budgets that might take some of the pressure off of uh, property taxpayers. Yeah, thanks for the question. I, you know, it's always a challenging year uh, with school budgets uh, for a number of reasons, but I think in particular, based on my experience as a superintendent, I think the, the increases we're seeing just out of the gate uh, projected to the Ed Fund are gonna make it especially challenging. I think then you factor in the uncertainty about next year and, and what the operational costs will be. Uh, make it very challenging, and there's the general anxiety among taxpayers among about their own personal uh, financial condition is going to make it especially challenging. Um, but in terms of the federal dollars, I think you know there there are protections built into how those funds can be used. Uh, they can't be used essentially to supplant, let's say, quote unquote, regular expenses. But to the extent those expenses are qualified as being COVID related, then they are eligible for reimbursement through many of the programs that have been established. So. I know many districts are leveraging those funds to their maximum advantage, so uh, that should be of help. Okay. Uh, and for um, Dr. Levine or perhaps Secretary Smith, uh, I'm wondering, uh, have you determined the metrics um, for when you would consider a phase, uh, for instance, phase 1A or, or a particular age band completed? especially since you know the assumption is not everyone is going to accept a vaccination or will you target a certain percentage or uh, the the opportunity to offer everyone a vaccine I, I guess I'm wondering how do you know when it's time to move on when we're finished um, it, it, we're going to have overlapping bands it's just going to happen as we as we move forward but when we think we're substantially finished for example in phase two, which is 75 plus, we know there's approximately 50,000 people within that, um, within that age bracket here in, living here in Vermont. When we get near to that, uh, that number, or we have some analysis, which we hope to have in terms of what the uptake is in that age group, We'll, new, we'll know when to move on to the next uh, age band. That doesn't preclude anybody that misses their age band to come and get 
um, get tested because basically what we want them to do every time we say a next age band, for example, the first is 75 plus, the next thing we'll say is 70 plus. We're not precluding anybody that's 75 plus from getting getting their vaccine. So that is, um, I, did I did I miss your question? I, no, no, no. I was I was just you, you've answered it uh, uh, pretty well. I, I was just curious whether there was concern about there being um, sort of a lull in the in the transition between the brackets, and it, and it yeah. sounds like you're taking steps to try to avoid that. Yeah, we are, and I don't think there's going to be a lull. Um, as we as we make sure we're not going to get down to zero in one age band before we move on to the next age band. We don't want that low. Low. By the way, if I could amend something that I said earlier, I had mentioned there may have been inmates. There are no inmates that are positive now in our correctional facility. Okay. And if there's time, I would like one question of Dr. Levine. Um, uh, with a couple of days, uh, over 200, um, is there any possibility of tightening restrictions uh, in the days ahead? Yeah, just to add on to Secretary Smith first, the uh, vaccination uh, program relies on registration, so appointments, and it, it will become evident when one phase has less people making appointments. So that will be another sort of uh, safety net, if you will, allowing us to have good insight quickly into the fact that we can open up the next phase because there's less demand in the previous phase. So there'll be a variety of ways for us to get at that. With regard to your question, um, I, I, I'm concerned that we've had two days in the very low 200 range. Um, but certainly we wouldn't use this, just that experience post-holiday to do anything dramatic in terms of our policies right now. Um, so I would, I would ask you to uh, indulge a little time because we do want to get through the post-Christmas and post-New Year's um, time frame. You know, you'll recall when we had the um, larger increase in cases uh, related to our central Vermont outbreak and the timing around that, uh, it didn't necessarily mean that the solution was to become more restrictive across the board right away. Um, so sometimes one needs to just let these uh, uh, events play out, if you will, a little bit um, before you uh, in intervene in a very strict way. Uh, clearly, I do want all Vermonters to know that in this post-holiday time, we are seeing more cases and they need to be really uh, not letting their guard down as they proceed in their daily lives uh, and to continue to follow all of the guidance that they've been trying to so strictly follow all along uh, and not let that lapse now. All right, we're gonna move. Okay, thank you everyone. To, uh, before I, I get to my next person, I just want to let you know that a couple of the reporters who missed their turn are at are at a back end at the end of the queue. So we still have eight in the queue, and it's about 12:30. Next up is Ian, <coughs> Ian Wallace Allen, VT Digger. Hi, um, Commissioner Sherling. We know that about 50 people travel down to DC from the Chittenden County area in that bus. Are there any law enforcement agencies as to investigating whether um, these Vermonters were involved in a riot that erupted outside the Capitol and inside the Capitol building? Uh, or do you know, is anyone investigating that? Thanks for the question, Ann. Well, we don't comment on uh, active investigations. I can tell you generally that uh, the state police, our intelligence center, and uh, any law enforcement in Vermont are, are uh, actively uh, cooperating with federal authorities as they explore all avenues uh, and all uh, potential tangents to what occurred in Washington on Wednesday. Um, there were reports that someone from Southern Vermont entered the Capitol building, but this is just a report. And um, have you heard anything like that? Again, we don't uh, discuss active uh, investigations as they unfold, but uh, if there's something substantive to report, we'll certainly get it out as quickly as possible. Would you characterize this as an active investigation? 
Uh, I would say we're actively cooperating uh, and assisting federal authorities, as I think um, just about every state is uh, at this point. Um, so that's probably the best way to characterize it. All right. Thank you so much. Cameron, St. Albans Messenger. You've been muted. To unmute yourself, press star six. Vice Education 1 to Prison um, for Secretary Smith. Uh, as far as Northwest Correction. You are no longer muted. A couple cases there, it went on full lockdown. Is this announcement, uh, are there any additional cases above, over and above those two uh, as part of this latest announcement? Cameron, I apologize. Uh, we somehow muted ourselves. Uh, so could you, uh, your apologize for this, but could you repeat the question? No, no worries. Uh, uh, so as far as um, the prisons question, uh, as far as Northwest State goes, I know a couple weeks ago there were a few cases there. Um, I was wondering if this recent announcement, are, those these, are there any cases over and above what was reported a couple weeks ago? And um, what about correctional officer vaccinations? Uh, are they in the current phase of EMS or... Is there any consideration for bumping them up in the queue? The um, these are new cases, and and there are new cases. I don't I don't have the exact count. I think corrections will have that for you uh, later on uh, this afternoon, in terms of their press release. But um, so these are in addition to what you were describing a few weeks ago. Uh, like I said, five of our facilities have new cases this week, and uh, Northwest obviously is one of them because the only one that doesn't is St. Johnsbury. Um, in terms of correctional officers, in terms of any group and grouping, we are going, as I mentioned before, with this age grouping um, concept because it is the most simple, it is the least divisive, that one group gets it over another. Um, as we come out of 1A and go into phase two, um, and it also protects the most vulnerable. So if those correctional officers are in 75 plus, 70 plus, 65 plus, they will be the first um, uh, priority as we move into phase two uh, in going, um, in vaccinating those who are likely to die. Uh, from this virus, and that's what we're, that's our primary objective here is to prevent death. And so that is, uh, that's the reason for the age grouping. As I showed you on the graph, you know, it, once you get below 65, um, your chances of dying from this virus are greatly reduced. I'm not saying you can't, but they're greatly, greatly reduced as opposed to those over 65. So uh, th there isn't any sort of plans other than the age grouping plan right now um, for any special special groups. Okay, um, and then my final question relates to schools, um, Sir Secretary French. Uh, I know discussions are early at this point, but has there been any um, discussion as far as vaccination of students um, would this be mandatory or treated like other vaccinations where exemptions could be applied? Um, has there been any discussion on that? So Dr. Levine here going to answer your question. If we, if we continue to only have the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, they are only uh, able to be given to individuals age 16 and 18 and higher, which would exclude a tremendous proportion of the uh, school age population, if you will. We're still waiting to see if there will be a, a future platform, uh, whether it's AstraZeneca or who knows what, uh, that would potentially be licensed and um, have an age range that would include uh, any any age in grade school or high school. 
So no strategy right. around that because we, we, we can't actually give the vaccine to, to the majority of students in Vermont. All right, thank you. Jolie, Local 22. Jolie, Local 22. Hi, um, I just wanted to know um, approximately how many more people need to be vaccinated in 1A? And is it safe to say that uh, phase two will begin um, by the end of the month at the earliest? The end of the month is probably a good um, sort of to put a pin in to that aspect in terms of when we'll be going to phase two. Um, in terms of the, uh, we only have the total number of vaccinated, which I gave this week, at, uh, gave today as 21,000. Um, I don't have precisely the, uh, the number on that, but, but we're indicating just, just by monitoring what is going on with getting through the long-term care facilities and getting through the, uh, the medical personnel, um, we think uh, that putting a pin on the end of January probably is, is a good, good way of looking at it. And then just a question for uh, Secretary French. Um, considering that the state has taken great steps to keep children in school uh, and to meet April's in-person schooling goal, um, has there been any consideration for um, possibly altering the community's um, vaccination strategy and bumping up teachers, prioritizing them in the queue? Yeah, thanks. The um, <clears throat> Yeah, just to reiterate, I think, you know, the... Um, the goal for April is really, you know, firstly, it's based on an assessment of where we think the conditions will be. And vaccination, um, you know, my view functions as one of the key tools in our tool bag to help improve the conditions. But certainly, I think the, the broader strategies around vaccination, as you heard both Secretary Smith and Dr. Levine speak to, um, there's a lot of unknowns, and it's also largely predicated on federal policy, federal logistics at this point. So. Um, certainly, we'll, we'll keep an eye on that, but right now our projection for April is based on uh, a conclusion that we think conditions will be improving, and it's also informed by our, um, our priority to get kids back in school because we know that's the best thing for them. Thank you. Kat, WCAS. Questions for Dr. Levine. Last night in his inaugural address, Governor Scott said that they hope to have us reach a point where life would begin to feel normal again by this summer, possibly earlier. In your mind, what does that mean? What does feeling normal look like to you in terms of all the precautions that we're taking right now to combat the virus? Thanks, Kat. That's a great question. Um, I think most people in the country feel that normal means not wearing masks, hugging one another, not having to worry about who you gather with, uh, not needing to avoid crowds, um, distancing being a phenomenon of the past. Uh, if that's, that's like the big picture normal. Um, you know, I don't think uh, most people think that the summer will be that normal. However, there's a lot more within that context that would make life seem like it's a lot more normal. Like we wouldn't have restrictions on some of the things we have restrictions on now from a, a policy level, in terms of the size of gatherings in different places, the number of people who can be at an event indoor versus outdoor, um, the um, perhaps restrictions on uh, parties at restaurants, the number of parties at a table and uh, how much of capacity could be, uh, you know, exceeded or not. So, you know, a lot of the things that are part of the executive order uh, that get renewed um, as the conditions uh, warrant uh, might be able to be uh, lessened. Um, so that kind of normal is a lot different than saying we're not going to wear masks, we're not going to worry about, you know, the close contact with people, et cetera, et cetera. 
I think most people in public health feel that we still have a ways to go for those kinds of things, um, probably more towards the late summer, fall, uh, but I don't want to be held to dates like that because there's so much to uh, rely on with allocation of vaccine and things of that sort. But I think it's much more, you know, those kinds of things that are built into emergency orders that um, are certainly warranted at times of major virus prevalence and virus transmission across communities, but that could be relaxed in a, in a uh, much more improved uh, health environment. And kind of a follow-up question to that, there were many people who postponed some big life events, weddings, you know, funerals, major anniversaries, et cetera, from last year because it wasn't safe to have a larger party or they didn't want to have all of the prohibitions of masks and distancing and things like that. Given that those large events often require a lot of advance notice and advance planning, and there are also industries that rely on those incomes in Vermont, what is your advice to people who are at the start of the year trying to think about, okay, can I have my 2021 wedding? Can I hold that belated memorial service that we put off from last year for a loved one? Yeah, you know, you've got me in a bad position here because people are going to put deposits down based on Dr. Levine's advice, and I'm not going to be able to give them that granularity of advice, so I'll just start there. Um, but again, when you talk in public health circles, Again, we're still thinking, you know, as the year evolves, whether that means late summer, whether that means fall, whether that means end of the year, that uh, a lot of these restrictions may not be in place anymore because a sufficient number of people have been vaccinated, because we've been able to suppress the virus by all the behaviors we're doing in the first half of the year, um, and things may look very different. Uh, so it's way more realistic to think about an October wedding in 2021 than it was in 2020. Um, but having said that, uh, don't hold me to the date. All right, thank you. Tom, the Vermont Standard. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, all of my questions have been addressed for today, so, so thank you. Thank you, Tom. Steve, NEK TV. Hi, can you? Hi, can you hear me? We can. Great, thanks, uh, Rebecca. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Levine, uh, I got a couple for you, if I may. Uh, there's been only seven deaths in the in the U.S. this fall uh, attributed to the flu. Uh, normally, there's about 10,000 plus. Uh, the CDC says that masks uh, and and hand washing um, appear to be working for the flu, um, but <clears throat> they don't seem to be working for COVID. And um, I was wondering if Vermont is still testing uh, people with flu symptoms for flu A and flu B, number one. Yeah, so you're really asking, is the healthcare community testing? Because obviously as a state, we're not doing the kind of testing we're doing for COVID with large scale testing operations uh, for that purpose. So people with flu symptoms, I have no doubt are getting tested for the flu. Um, if, you know, if, if the clinical picture looks right, I imagine they're all getting tested for COVID first uh, because of the situation with COVID. But you do point out a good point that um, we are seeing markedly less flu across the country, and they did see markedly less flu in many places in the Southern Hemisphere during their flu season. So, uh, commenting on the kinds of behaviors people are practicing as protective against another respiratory virus like the flu does make sense. Um, my second question, um, with, the, with this mRNA um, technique or, uh, or, or vaccine, um, traditionally uh, the vaccines have uh, like adjuvants in them to uh, jumpstart uh, the immune system. 
Um, like in the old days, it was mercury, and then they switched to aluminum, and and uh, I I don't recall what they've been using lately. But to the uh, to this mRNA uh, vaccines uh, contain adjuvants to uh, to to like jumpstart or spark the Im an, an immune response. Yeah, I don't believe they do. I, I, I don't, I don't want to be 100% authoritative on that, but I don't believe they do. Um, but, you know, people need to understand that though this is a new technology for vaccine, it's not new just because it was invented when COVID came around. It's been around for a long time and been tested extensively in many other arenas. It's just this is the first... Uh, real disease, we're using it for uh, a vaccine for the population at large. I can check into uh, so, if there is a specific adjuvant in there. Um, that would be great. Uh, sure. I would really, uh, I would really appreciate that. Um, I guess, uh, I guess that's my two. Um, yep. Thank you. Um, uh, thank, thank you. Thank you all. Aaron, VT Digger. Aaron, VT Digger. Okay, Avery, WCAX. Hi, right, thanks for coming back to me. So how do health conditions fit into these next vaccine groups? Have you all set specific conditions that will allow people to get a vaccine earlier? And can you clarify when in the lineup they can expect to get their shot? So a 50, 40, or 30-year-old who's immune compromised, when should they expect to get vaccinated? Or are they in the first age, first age band? Yeah, thanks for bringing health conditions back to the uh, podium here, because they, they are important. Um, and in fact, this very day, perhaps this very hour, uh, our advisory committee is actually uh, talking about medical conditions. The CDC has uh, <clears throat> published on its website <clears throat> conditions that uh, are important for adults who might be at increased risk uh, for severe illness from COVID. So not necessarily getting COVID, but just if you get COVID, what's going to make you have a poorer outcome? And um, I've mentioned majority of these before, but I'll just mention those again and a few others. Uh, cancer, chronic kidney disease, COPD, which is emphysema, heart conditions, but serious heart conditions like heart failure, problems with the muscle of the heart, problems with uh, the kind of heart disease that affects the vessels and leads to heart attacks. And then um, diabetes, type 2 diabetes. Uh, I think in mid-December, I got asked a question about Down syndrome and said that people with Down syndrome uh, often have some of these other conditions like cancer or heart disease that would put them at increased risk, uh, but they weren't on the list. Well, wouldn't you know it, on December 23rd, they got added to the list. So that's now on the list as well. And then any disease state, as I've discussed before, that compromises your immune system. Uh, if you've had an organ transplant, if you're on uh, medications to suppress your immune system so you can maintain that organ transplant, etc. cetera. Um, so those are the ones that uh, we have talked about before. In addition, the CDC raises the issues uh, regarding obesity, especially severe obesity, uh, sickle cell disease, which certainly belongs on the list, uh, and they also mention pregnancy and smoking. So the way we have things outlined at this point in time, and you've seen the data we're using to show the strong correlation between uh, age putting you at severe risk for a poor outcome, in this case, the poor outcome being actually death, uh, we are going through the higher age ranges that were illustrated well on the slide, and then after that, uh, coming to the population 
uh, which in Vermont is quite broad, actually, uh, and we're determining the actual numbers now uh, of people who have many of the conditions that I just listed. Uh, but they would come next in the uh, stratification system we're using. And I'm assuming when you say upper age ranges, you mean is that 70 plus? Uh, 65 plus for the three sets of okay. uh, age ranges. And uh, presumably, of course, many Thank people you. with chronic diseases will already be in those categories, but anybody under those ages who has these chronic diseases would then come in next, and we're just discerning exactly how big that would be and exactly which conditions um, make sense for us. All right. Thank you. That's it. That's it. Um, we'll be back on Tuesday, and the governor will be joining us as well. Thank you, everyone.